Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, y'all. I'm Lori, and I'm an alcoholic. So happy to hear you say that. It's one of the most beautiful things in the world to hear that chant back at me. I got sober January 1st of 1981, and that is to credit to my higher power, sponsorship, and this beautiful program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I am so privileged to be here today. I just keep laughing because I'm like, oh, the young people speaker, you know, it's a little late for that, you know, because <laughs> I'm not so young anymore, you know. But if you don't drink and you don't die, you get old here. You know, what a privilege. What a privilege to grow old in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, and I'm just beginning that older journey now at 62. Um, I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska. And I love Nebraska. It's a beautiful place and it's a beautiful place to drink and get sober. Um, I'm number four of six kids, an extremely alcoholic family system. My mom's an old Al-Anon. She's been going for over 50 years, and uh, my dad died from this disease. Um, And he was a beautiful man, really beautiful man. And he had every ism that there was. He had drugs, alcohol, sex, thievery, women, you name it. He had it. And yet he was a beautiful soul. And in the end, though the disease got him, he actually... um, Didn't have any drugs and alcohol in his system. Uh, He ended his own life running a car into a semi. But the interesting thing about that is my mom's Al-Anon sponsor son held him in his arms when he died and talked to him until he died. And he knew who he was. He knew my mom. He knew our story. And when he said what his name was, you know, when they went through the car, he knew it was my father. And my father died in somebody's arms that knew about us. You know, that had to be God. You know, what's the odds of something like that? You know, that just doesn't happen in in the world. But anyway, so I grew up, like, just primed for it. I don't think the stuff I grew up in made me an alcoholic. Some of the stuff made me sad. Um, Had educational gaps. A laugh, kind of lack of lifetime friends and things like that because of my drinking and because of our moving all the time. With my dad's kind of lifestyle, he'd uproot us a lot. And so I didn't get a lot of chance to be social. Like, I've been able to be part of this whole community for 41 years. You know, what a beautiful thing. You guys have given me something that I never had growing up, that consistency and love and stability. It's just unreal. You know, I just appreciate it all so much. And, um, but we just move, move, move. And I was doing things in early elementary school. I can't tell you when I started, but I can tell you I stole knockers in first grade. I don't know if you all know what knockers are, but they're these big balls on these strings. And and people would hit themselves with them all the time, like, you know, but, and people love knockers. So I stole some and I got my own booze, got my own booze. I had already figured out how to do an illegal activity and get booze in first grade. Now, older kids get did give me some before that. But the fact that I ran with it, I mean, how many first graders do you know just, you know, pick up a drink, drink, and run with it, you know, try to figure out how to get their own stuff, you know? Unreal. Why well, was that girl? So by the time I got out of elementary school, I had already done a lot of things I was going to do my whole life that got me here. And that really is, just shocks me to look back, to even look at my own story. I go like, what? <laughs> is that really true? Yeah, that's really true. And everything I'm sharing, I ran it by my mom to make sure, Mom, is there anything in there that isn't 100% honest that I'm going to say that I want to share with these folks? She said, no, nope, that's all the truth, you know? And um, it's beautiful that we have that kind of honesty to share. But I was ready, like in in. It kills me to think that I already knew I was an alcoholic and I was different from other people in elementary school. I already knew that. And back then I was a freak, but not a cool freak. I was a freak. You know, there wasn't little kids doing that. Like there's more of those doing that today. But back then that was not normal in my neighborhood. There was one other kid. 
So I knew I was in trouble, like, even as a little kid, that I was very, very different. And um, junior high, I got there. And what's really weird about that, we moved. We went to this new, really nice junior high. And people started drinking and stuff before wacky tobacco and stuff before school. And I was all of a sudden a cool freak. You know, I got to be all of a sudden cool because I had more experience. Yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> you know, and I didn't, you wouldn't think that would have been an asset, but to those kids, it was an asset. I was like really like something special, you know, and it was so short lived one more time, one more time, short lived, you know, um, my mom, like I was so, I used so, so regular that my mom thought I was using drugs and alcohol one day when I was straight, she was questioning me backwards, forwards and sideways. She, it was crazy. She really did. She was like, what's wrong with you today? What's wrong? And I'm like inside going like, it's the only day I'm not blotto. And she thought something was wrong with me because that was normal. Blotto is how I knew how to function and exist in the world, how AA does that for us. Booze did that for me. I knew how to look okay under the influence. If I wasn't under the influence, I looked crazy. I could take a trip without taking a trip. I was just something, you know, and, uh, it's true. I could. And, you know, I was really glad when I didn't have to do that no more, you know, after I got here after a few years, but yeah, so I bottomed out here. I am going like in, in junior high, all this stuff's going on and I'm cool for a short window. And my first boyfriend who I'm still friends with to this day, um, I got pregnant and, my dad had double standards, even though he was a bad boy, he had a double life he lived. So we, he didn't bring bad boy stuff home and he came home and we were supposed to be not bad, but we were, you know, running amok most of the time. So we did bad things, but he kicked me out, you know? So I was 16, I was pregnant and I took a look at myself living in this group home and I knew one more time. Here I am, knowing I'm an alcoholic, I have no way out. I have no control. You know, when I drink, it got to the point, you know, it just, I started, I, I had baby blackouts, like in, you know, in elementary school, like m maybe like an hour at the most, you know, and like a few hours by junior high, still didn't lose a day by junior high, but I knew those, those blackouts scared me. All I do is drink and black out and then keep drinking. And they really scared me. So I knew like I was an alcoholic and I had to stop and, and getting pregnant, you know, really made me look. And I said, I'm unfit to be a parent period because I'm an alcoholic, you know, and I gave that little boy up for adoption, you know, and I thank him because he did help me look at myself honestly and um, I gave him up out of love. It's the most difficult thing I ever did. Most difficult thing I ever did. And I will tell you that AA heals all wounds. When they say those 12 steps work, they don't, they're not kidding. It heals all wounds, no matter how deep. And if you didn't heal that wound going through the first time, I'm just telling you, go through again. Go through again. Go through again. I'm a stepaholic. <laughs> I really am, you know. Things would get better when I applied them like I could heal from that kind of hurt of giving that child up. You know, my higher power could help me do that. You people could help me do that, you know. And uh, so I, I went through that. I still didn't know there was a way out, though. I was like, you just keep doing this. I thought if you're an alcoholic, they go out real weird in my family. There was people that burn up in chairs, two of them. One hung themselves, one got shot in a drug deal, you know, so I'm like, that's kind of what happens with alcoholism. You know, the ending's not pretty, you know, so I knew I made the right decision there as a teenager. Um, and to this day, I'll stand by that. You know, it was the most selfish thing I ever did. And, uh, but I went about still drinking, you know, got out of, got done being pregnant, gave that son up and just went out and just kept doing what I'd been doing that doesn't work. It quit working. It no longer made me hip slick and cool. So that just happened to me early. I don't know why. 
But alcoholism just came up and got me instantly. And, um, but I kept doing the same thing and I kept doing the same thing. And, uh, I hit, I got up to, I wrecked a few cars. I mean, I got a brain, brain injury. Um, if you've seen the dent in the passenger car door, cause it was a metal, it was a little Chevy Chevette and the metal, man, my head went, you know, I was driving and, and it just skidding it. There used to be in Omaha, Nebraska, where I'm from, the railings on the I-80 going through the middle of Omaha, all these dents, because it kept spinning and dinging and then spinning and dinging and spinning and dinging. And I remember that happening, just the spinning and dinging. And it did, my head got really big. I didn't know that you were supposed to go to a hospital if you have a brain injury. Oh no, no, no. I was worried my mom's going to kill me. (laughs) She's going to be so upset. I'm going to go hide my head. And I was a workaholic too. So it's only three days of work I missed. I went to my friend's house and was ice in my head trying to get the swelling to go down. You know, I could have died. You know, that car started, there was tread coming off, flying. I don't know how that car ran. My uncle ended up taking it as trade in, even though it was like a two year old car, but it was only good for running around his car lot, not for anything else. He used it for, they drove it around the car lot to do errands and didn't take it off of it. It would never be sold. Um, I don't know how I drove in that thing, you know? And then about a year later, I'm like, I'm going to quit drinking. I'm going to quit drinking. I need to quit drinking. I'd pray about it and everything else. And uh, prayer, you know, I thought, me and God can do this. You know, I can do this, you know? And I'd pray and pray, and I just couldn't do it. Couldn't quit drinking. Just kept drinking. Car wrecks seemed to be a big thing for me. And since there's a lot of corn in, in Nebraska, the next one I was came out of a blackout. And this is what really, for me, was was a bottom two is because when you have like what's called reverse tolerance and alcoholism, if you know anything about the genetic stuff of it, you know, you black out like just even a drink. Like I just barely tilt the glass. It wouldn't even be like a whole drink inside of me. And I'd go in a blackout. But then I continued drinking. I didn't get to remember if I had fun or not. Nothing. Just drink. And let booze run your life like that's, you know, when one flew over the cuckoo nest. You know, first the girl took a drink, then the drink took a drink, and then the drink took the girl. Man, it took me. It owned me. It owned me. I didn't even have any decisions when I was under the influence at all. And um, I hated that because I did want a little bit of control, (laughs) just a little bit. And I had nil. Besides, I could guarantee you, I could maybe white knuckle it a few days. Just a few days, you know? And uh, I was driving my car, came out of these cornfields, out of this blackout. I know I went to a party the night before. Went to a kegger with a kegger in my trunk. Because, you know, just in case there's not enough keg, I got a pony keg. Had it in the trunk in case they didn't have enough. That's the kind of alky. I, my thinking was just messed up. And, uh, oh, gosh. I remember going camping once doing that, too, where we had this big keg, and we had this giant tent to sleep in, but you weren't supposed to have kegs there, so that the keg had a tent. We all sleeping out on the ground, drunk, every night, you know? Kegs really got rated very high in my life. Um, stupid things. But I came out of that cornfield that morning, flew across a couple lanes, over some islands, they were like metal, so you could hear the car like, whoosh, you know, this weird tire noise. Cross another two lanes. How I didn't get hit, one more time I'd go like, God save me again. How I didn't kill somebody. Don't ask me why. No other car as I'm bouncing back and forth got hit. No other car as I'm flying across those streets. I didn't kill somebody else, and I could have. So easy. So easy. And I knew when I came out of that cornfield, I'm like, oh, my God. But I had such little care about myself. I could care. Am I, is my arm okay? Is my leg okay? Am I okay? Oh, no, I'm just worried about the car. It was my new car. You know, it reminded me of the guys like a Harley or something, and their Harley falls over, and they're like, Harley! And they're like, their legs laying on the ground, and they're like, ah, the Harley, you know? But that's how I was with my car, you know? I was like, but I cared about that. I didn't even care what happened to me anymore. I didn't have any self-esteem. 
And so I went on. That was in about August when that cornfield thing happened. I was trying really hard, so I'd make it like a week. I was really trying hard. And my mom went to al so I'd get the big book. You know, when I'd come home, if I did drink, I'd get the big book, and I'd go upstairs, and I'd say, me and God are going to go do these 12 steps that I'm reading about, and I'll get sober, right? You know? So it doesn't work that way. No man is an island. No chick is an island. We can't do this thing alone. You know, my higher power made me interdependent. I need you to get to him. You know, I'm, I'm dependent on you folks. You're my lifeline. And, but I kept thinking I could do it on my own, that ego. And my dad, who died from this disease, at the time he told me, you're stronger than your sisters, because they were a little bit worse than I was. I know, hard to believe. But if you met my three sisters, you'd understand. Crazy. All three of them made it to AA. But... Um, yeah, they were nuts, 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 though. I mean, my sister would bring home, like, things outside issues, put it in the middle of the table and start cleaning and separating, and my mom would be, like, having a panic attack and getting her out of the house and calling the police on her. It was crazy. Or one of them were always overdosing, so I was mild compared. So my dad said, you're stronger. You're stronger than them. Oh, God, I wanted to please my dad so bad. I was a dad pleaser. I wanted my dad to just love me and accept me. I wanted to do it for him. I wanted to get sober without you folks, without any help. I could do it for my dad, right? Couldn't. I had to disappoint my father. Thank God. Thank God I disappointed him. You know, because I couldn't do it. Me and the big book couldn't do it. Didn't work. Didn't work. I didn't really understand the AA thing. I, I knew the big book, but I didn't know the program and um, so I thought you lock yourself up when you're that incapable of not doing something Um, the last time I drank was a New Year's Eve it was before the clock rang in and I'd been white knuckling it for oh gosh a week or so just I'm gonna not do this I'm gonna not do this and uh, I did anyway and I swear if there was a devil, it was standing behind me. If there was such a thing, and I'm not sure if there is, but it sure seemed like the devil was standing behind me, breathing down my neck. I could feel it. I just felt like this horror breathing down my neck. And I saw my future in front of me, and I was, I had like shark kind of eyes, soulless. I was real bloated. I was sitting on this bar stool, but I kept fallen off. I couldn't stay on it. And it just wasn't the woman that I wanted to be. And plus I had a premonition the year before that I was going to die. I thought I was going to die at 21. That was the number I had. And I took out life insurance for my mom because there was two siblings left. And my whole family was bottoming out with, with every, the, the disease was just destroying us. We were like in the battle zone. Everybody was falling like flies. And um, at the same time, it's like everybody hit bottom at the same time. My family was just crumbling. And I thought, well, at least my mom will be better off when I die. And I meant it. I meant it. I really thought that was going to happen. But because of the grace of God, I had a different plan for me. You know, I put myself in a treatment facility. It was called, well, I'm not going to say, not name. It's closed, but anyway, it's really cool. One of the guys in AA started it. It was named after it. He never told me that, but I just found that out during the pandemic, doing some history studies on AA in Omaha, Nebraska. And I went, put myself in this treatment center. I thought they'd really lock me up, put me in a straitjacket, you know, and I wouldn't be able to drink, you know? And the miracle is the guy that got me for what they called phase one, of the treatment center was a guy that was in the first 2000s of Alcoholics Anonymous. He was like 40 years sober. Don Farrell, what a beautiful man. Never took credit, never bragged about it. I researched the history on him because I knew he had been around in the early days. He was very humble. These, these people with time were humble. They were humble beyond anything I can still imagine. And I'm still trying to grasp for what these old timers had. 
I'm, I'm trying to get it. And I have a small piece of it, but I have a long ways to go. But Don Farrell had you for one, two, three. This old fart in AA. There you guys were. There you guys were. People who didn't just, you know, they went to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, but they also made a living of it. They actually made it their vocation. And they were a bunch of old drunks. You know, I remember him telling me when he drank, his pimples fell off. I just thought that was the cutest thing in the world. <laughs> and I could relate to that, because when I drank, my legs got long. I became a very good dancer. Yeah, I didn't have short legs anymore. You know, and I'm sure you all got a story. There's something that changed instantly that just took away that low self-esteem little thing at first. But, uh, yeah, I loved him, and he took me through the first three steps. What a privilege and an honor for for, you know, this little 21-year-old snot, I just turned 21 years old, you know, ended up in a treatment center with some old-timer taking me through the steps, you know? And I had really taken one, two, and three, you know? He really, we had long discussions about it. I had taken one, two, and three. You know, when I walked in there, I knew that I was powerless over alcohol and that my life was unmanageable, beyond a shadow of a doubt. No doubt, never had had an inkling of a doubt since I walked in this room. Never changed my mind on that one. Not for a moment. I still go back to step one. Like some people don't think we go back all the way, but I still go back to step one on other stuff. Yeah, I'm powerless over my kids' tuition. Unmanageable by me. And I, I walk through those steps, one through 12, on whatever comes up in my life. And the solution's there. And like the conference says, by the time I get to, into those 12 steps, I know peace. I know peace. I'm okay. It works on anything. Anything that we apply it on. You know, so, but that was my first time applying it, you know, to my alcoholic problem. Just the flat, being restored to sanity when you're brand new. You're not doing this. <laughs> or whatever else you guys were doing, Right? All right, I know about all that stuff, you know, right? Whatever else you were doing, we just quit doing it. That is sanity. When you're new, what an act of sanity to no longer have to pick up the glass. You know, it took me a while to figure that out, that that had happened to me. You know, like, wow, I'm not picking up the glass. I don't even think about picking up the glass. Unbelievable, you know? And that third step, oh my gosh, I'm a, I love that third step. I know how many of y'all love, if you haven't done it, do it. Get on your knees after this, okay? If you're new enough to not have done the third step, get on your knees. Go Or do it with all of us. You can say like, come on, do the third step with me. I'll do it with you, you know? But what a beautiful thing to turn your will and your life over the care of God as you understand God. As you understand God. You know, like I have a very individual, beautiful relationship with this higher power. I walk, talk, chew gum, roller skate. Me and him roller skate all the time. Um, I talk to my higher power more when I roller skate than probably anything else. I used to like to horseback and talk to, to my higher power. It was really cool. One day I was taking a ride through Bakersfield. I live in Davis now, but I used to live in Bakersfield. And there's these golden hills out in the oil fields. Golden hills are gray, whatever you want to call them, right? <laughs> I was having this God moment, and I was doing like the third step. I was going through the third step in my head on this beautiful horse. And my dog, Lacey, she was with me out on the trail. It was me, just me and Lacey and the horse. And I thought, it can't get any better than this God. And the minute I said that, a lady took a picture. I didn't know it. She was a newspaper person, and it was in the newspaper. It was the most beautiful, angelical moment. And somebody took a picture of that moment. And it was was already cemented in my mind, but to think that somebody else could see what I was feeling and actually photograph it and the beauty of that moment. You know, A has given me so many of those moments. But when I was in that treatment center, I was just glad to not feel like picking up that glass. You know, I was glad. I had kind of had to turn my will in my life over to the care of your higher power at first, you know, because I had this misconception of a higher power that thought I was bad. I was a bad person. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, if you're bad like me, 
you know, your higher power might just want to hit you with lightning. Well, maybe, or uh, that's what I really thought. I really, really thought that. Um, so the fact that, you know, like I would talk to you people and I would take these steps and I'd do the fourth and treatment back then, they took you through four and five. Thank God. Oh man, I wish more people went through four and five when they went to treatment. Cause boy, they told me this could make the difference between you drinking and not drinking. If you're honestly, if you're honest and you're thorough, this will make a difference between you drinking or not drinking. That's what that old timer told me in there. And I believed him. He told me I might just drink if I didn't do this thing. So I was really worried. I was turning every stone. I told stories about me selling tickets and dancing on the little countertop like this. When I was before kindergarten, I think I saw some movie with dancers dancing and anyway, and that boys would put quarters on the thing. It was in my fifth step. I felt guilty for that. Can you believe that? I was, I would beat myself up for anything. You know, not just the stuff I did in the end, like drinking and driving, nearly killing people and scaring my parents to death, you know, but I would beat myself up over that. I'd be like that bad child. What a bad child. You know, what was wrong with that little girl? <laughs> she was just a little girl, you know, Hey, help me just give up the stuff that I did that was really bad and kind of like be able to look back at the stuff that wasn't that I beat myself up for breathing. I mean, I was, I was messed up when I got here. I was really messed up. So I had stuff from like that to, you know, robbing my employer and, you know, a lot of the hurt and pain from growing up, how I grew up, you know. And the beauty about that is I got out of that treatment center. I went to 48th Street Club. The two guys that started 48th Street Club in Omaha, Nebraska, one of them was the guy that started that treatment center. That treatment center had six wings of a hospital. They put some people through there, you know, and I was in the new young people's ward at that time, you know. And, uh, and the other guy was sitting there. His name was Roger G. that started the club. He never told me that, but it's in the archives and stuff in the club history that I was reading up on, who is very, very humble too. Never bragged on himself, never took credit for anything just there to be of service to other alcoholics. Wow. Wow. That's something to really want. I got out and I was looking for a sponsor and this girl goes, my mom make a good sponsor. And so, and she was a coffee lady, mama Gail at 48th street club in Omaha. And she didn't even hesitate. You know, her daughter took me by the hand, drug me up there. And uh, I didn't think she was qualified because she only drank and I did other things. And I didn't think maybe she could understand a girl like me because she was just a real, just alcoholic all by itself. Never did, never smoked pot or anything. And um, I didn't think she could understand me because I asked her like, how, you know, but I did other stuff. And she goes, it's okay, honey. You know, don't worry about that. Just come to my house and blah, blah, blah at this time and this day. And we'll work the steps. And she took me back to one, you know, and I, and I, I did three, fourth and fifth steps my first year. And I look back at it and I think it's almost miraculous because we heal mind, body, and spirit. And those, those, when I went through the steps, it was like facts. First, it was just going through the facts the first time through. And the next time it was a real emotional thing. Like I really felt all of it. And there was this emotional healing. And then the third time, it was super spiritual. It's like all the stuff that was in that inventory it got spiritually like taken care of. So I needed to really do more than some people did in my early sobriety. But my first sponsor said, some people are sicker than honey, others, honey, and you're it. <laughs> you know, because she'd always go, you need to do just a little bit more. Just do a little bit more. And she was right. I needed every inch of it. You know, and now later on in sobriety, you, you end up doing, uh, gosh, to give Mama Gail some credit, I'll get, get on later there. I've had three beautiful sponsors. I have a fourth one now. Um, my last one, Sharon C. And from Newberry Park, she passed away um, during the pandemic just a year and a half ago. And uh, all three of those women that passed away, like Sharon, she was still trying to pick up the phone. Hey, Steve. Sharon was still trying to pick up the phone. 
even though she couldn't talk. She had some problems speaking at the end. And that last couple weeks, she'd still pick up the phone and try to talk to newcomers that were still calling her. She was still doing the deal. To the grave. To the grave. And I consider that such a privilege to be able to do something like that. My biggest fear when I got here was dying from alcoholism. When I first read the big book, the thing that popped out at me was that tombstone. The soldier that died by the, by the bottle rather than the musket. And I know that sounds crazy, but that's what jumped out to me because I related to that. The shame, like, oh my God, I don't want to die pitifully from this thing. And I still have a goal of dying sober. I was about a year sober, went to an alcathon. This guy named Dick Martin is gone now in Omaha, Nebraska. He was one of Clancy's babies. My sponsor didn't like him because she went to meetings without her teeth sometimes. And <laughs> she was a rough old lady from Oklahoma. And they kind of wanted you to wear a tie. Well, she didn't even put her teeth in sometimes, you know, or a dress, you know. So she didn't quite fit in with that crowd. But I loved everybody in AA like I still do. I've been that way since I was a small child. I just love people. I genuinely love people. And um, that really has served me well in Alcoholics Anonymous. Because I can fit any place that there's an AA meeting. Any place. All different shapes, sizes, and types of AA meetings. And, and Dick Martin was, he was a real sweetheart. And, uh, but at a year sober, my three siblings got sober too, and they all relapsed. Like I told you, we all bottomed at the same time. We, I, mean, I meant it. Like the whole family went into programs, like everybody bombed out, and they were all falling like flies. And it scared me, because I thought, if I have to drink again, I'd rather die. I was just a year sober. It was New Year's Eve, my first New Year's Eve sober, after you know I got sober, one year out. <sighs> And I went and talked to Dick Martin, and I shared it at an alcathon, you know, that I was thinking, like, if you can't tell me I can live sober, like, really live sober, I don't know that I want to stay alive. And I am not a suicidal person. I've never been suicidal, but I really couldn't imagine life going back out there again. And Dick Martin talked to me for a long time. He sat there and talked to me at that alcathon for a couple hours that night. We talked and talked and talked. And he told me, honey... You can stay sober the rest of your life. He goes, there's just one trick. You can only do it one day at a time. And I bought it hook, line, and sinker. I get chills just saying it. I mean, I literally just got chills through my entire body. I needed to hear that. Some people don't need to hear that. I needed to hear that. I needed to know that it's possible to do what I've seen three sponsors do. You know, to come to AA, to keep going through those steps. You know, there's not even enough time in, in a whole window to really go through the steps properly. I don't think I, there's people that can do it, but I don't know how the heck they do it. You know, share their story and go through all those steps properly. You know, but it's like good Irish stew. You don't want to leave any of them out, okay? It won't be the same. You got to do all of it. You got to do the whole program. You need the fellowship. Some people always say, it's not the meetings that keep you sober. Well, I'm here to tell you, some days it is. Some people say, oh, it's not the sponsor that keeps you sober. I'm here to tell you, some days it is. You know, I know it's my higher power, putting all this stuff together in a way that's miraculous. I mean, I, I know that, and I know my higher power is it. You know, that's the a, that's a source of my recovery. But the problem is, if I don't have that stuff to put together, that good Irish stew, if I don't do it all, go to meetings, read the book, book, pray, work with others, you know, all the stuff that we're taught here, be willing to be of service when asked. If we don't do that, we don't get good Irish stew. I want, I want good Irish stew. I want the best. I want the best recovery has to offer. And I feel like I've been privileged to have it. I feel like I've been risen from the dead more times than any of those Bible stories. I'm just telling you the truth. I should have died a few times when I was young. And I'd be like, okay, thanks for saving me again. Get back up, go back out and do it. But a few things have happened to me sober too that I could have died. And I haven't. You know? And my higher power has a way of recreating my life. So if anything happens to you, you're like, I can't recognize myself. What happened? What happened? 
Like I hadn't seen Zach for a while. I got really sick, sick, um, the last couple years. And, um, yeah, I'm lucky to be standing up here. Just let's say that. And I'm lucky to be standing. There was a point where I couldn't walk. That's why I was out there roller skating this morning when they were running. I'll be dinged if I'm not going to give it my A effort, right? Mm -hmm. But, and I'll be rolling farther than I did this morning later on. But, but I got real sick and I got a blood clotting disease that's supposed to kill you and you die from these aneurysms and all this stuff. And I got cancer and I went through a couple surgeries and a bunch of treatment. This is all like over a year. I lost all my muscle mass. I used to be a lifter. I was in pretty dang good shape. I mean, I rode my bike 50 miles the weekend before I started getting sick. And you know what? When I was laying there, I got really sad for a couple days. I got real scared. I got real scared. But I thought of my higher power. I kept going to meetings. I kept working with my sponsees, even if I was laying in bed. <laughs> you know, nobody knew exactly how sick I was because I wasn't going to tell somebody how sick I was. They would have wanted me in an institution where they take care of old people, and I wasn't going there. I'm at the young people's meeting, for God's sake. <laughs> I'm not going yet. But anyway, um, you know, I knew that my higher power, even if my legs didn't come back, I knew that my higher power could recreate my life. I absolutely was certain about it. I am certain about that. So, because he's done it before. It wouldn't be the first time. I don't know why. I think sometimes we doubt that we can be restored or renewed over and over and over again. You know, they say it's a one day at a time program. I think if you could work it perfect, you would do all 12 every day. If I could live this program perfect, I would be applying those 12 steps and the principles in them one day at a time, all of them. You know, I don't do it perfect. But I try to squeeze as many of them in as I can. And uh, gosh, it kills me. Like the first fifth step I did was in treatment. There was a guy that yelled at you. Just so you know, I was scared to go in there. He ended up falling asleep on me and snoring with his feet up on the desk. Yeah, you know, I took my inventory really serious too. It was like a, the world novel, right? Um, yeah, and then somebody had to listen to that two more times, believe it or not. <laughs> My poor sponsor, you know. I actually understand now why the man fell asleep. <laughs> you know, but back then I was devastated. Oh my God, I'll drink. So I went and did the rest of my fist step to my roommate. I said, I got to tell this or they said I'll drink. So I did. But, you know, I just go back to that because I really thought when I walked out of there, I thought if you tell it all, I like if God can't see on a cloudy day or something, like you didn't know maybe some of it. And I thought, if you admit it all out loud and to another person, that's when the lightning's going to come. <laughs> and I was still standing. So that was my hallelujah moment, folks. As I didn't get, like, my hair powder didn't go, bang, bang, you're gone, you know? And then my other hallelujah moment is when, you know, I did, you know, <laughs> did uh, working on the character defects, you know, six and seven. And I was like, but I will be the hole in the donut, you know? Because I thought if you took the character defects away, there'd be nothing left. Not true. There's a diamond inside of each of us that's just covered in a lot of muck, you know? But I didn't know that. You know, I really thought I was going to disappear, you know? And uh, the sponsor I have today, those three sponsors that passed away, my God, they did so many things. I've got things in the Narcotics Anonymous book that me and my sponsor wrote. I was just rereading that thing recently because I, I haven't really read it since back then in the first part of the 80s. Um, <laughs> we would go edit it, and I know some of our stuff is in there. <laughs> and uh, I was reading, I'm going, oh, my God, you can tell they had a bunch of people that were completely fried editing this thing <laughs> so but you have to laugh about it right but that first sponsor that never did drugs she went every week and they give us a little thing to be working on and me and her be there I don't know why more people didn't show up because there was a lot of people in NA back where I was at but um and we'd edit the book 
And we'd edit a book, and we'd edit it again, and we kept editing. That woman that never did drugs, you know? But she had the solution. She had the good Irish stew recipe. She had the 12 steps, you know? And she shared it with me every time we sat down. I've never had sponsorship that didn't take me to those 12 steps. I've known people that had sponsors that they didn't talk about the 12 steps that much. I'm like, but that's what a sponsor does. <laughs> 12 steps. That's what we got here. It's a beautiful thing, you know, and it's the thing that's going to bring you all the relief and all of the gifts and all of the peace and the serenity to meet calamity. Like we were joking about up here. They're like, yeah, it's a little crazy getting started here today. And I'm like, yeah, we got serenity to meet calamity. So we're okay. You know, it's just, you get all this wonderful stuff out of it. You know, I've been sponsoring a lot on zoom, meeting people and, and sponsoring on zoom. And it's really cool to see all these people getting sober on zoom. And you know what? They're all like wanting to get sober. They want somebody to open the big book with them and read it and go through the 12 steps. Um, gosh, it's just beautiful. It made me think of my sponsor, uh, Muriel, that used to take, we used to pack books when they let you go into Russia to start meetings. And I got to like, I always wished, oh, I wish I kept one book in Russian, you know? But that would have been a meeting without a book because every book was going to a place where they were establishing a meeting. But I like to think that I got to touch a lot of those books. You know, so if you get to go to a meeting in Russia and they open up one of those books in Moscow, you know, my, my sponsor probably took it over there and started one of those meetings, you know. She did that for a long time. You know, that's the kind of sponsorship I had. And then my last one that passed away, Sharon, she had family recovery like my family. We got a ton of people in AA, my family. I just had a brother-in-law pass away from COVID. He had 48 years. Um, I got another sober brother-in-law. I've got three sisters. One of my sisters has been in and out. The other two have uh, over 30 years. My mom has been in al on over 50 years. You know, I got to meet some of the really old timers through my mom, you know, because she ran with Elsa Chamberlain and stuff like that and Dr. Paul's wife and blah, 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 you know, all those people. So I'd go around like a little puppy dog with my al mom, meeting all these what we considered like really cool people in AA, you know, and all these really neat al -Anons. Those al were something. Elsa Chamberlain was something. If you've never listened to an Elsa Seed talk, you need to listen. She was something. Bye. Gotcha. Alrighty. Yeah. Gosh, I didn't even get into the last three steps much, but I will tell you that I was a poor girl from Nebraska, from the wrong kind of family, to get anywhere. A raised me. It's brought me up better than I could ever ask to been raised. I dreamed I had a bucket list when I got to AA. They said, make a bucket list. I said, I want an education. I want to travel. I want to learn to snow ski, and I want to learn to do stained glass. I think that was it. I didn't have much on it. It wasn't a very big bucket list. Um, still haven't snow skied or done stained glass, so those two need done this year. I'm going to commit to it. But... It took this simple girl from Nebraska that wanted education, and I got a doctorate for dang, I got a doctorate. You know, I have five degrees with this program, and literally the program is how I got the degrees. And I'd sit in meetings and study even. <laughs> when I was doing my doctorate, it got really hard at that level. And uh, so I'd take my books and sit in my meeting in the back row, not a, not a back row person, just because that's where I wouldn't be in the way, reading and listening. You know, because I wasn't going to miss my AA meetings. Never give your seat up if you're new and you don't want to drink anymore. Or if you're old and you don't want to drink anymore. You don't have to ever pick up a drink of alcohol again in your life. Ever. That is truth. Many alcoholics in AA have done it. I hope to be one of those to live that out to the end. So I got all that education. I got to go to school first semester in London and in England and got to go on the Oxford campus and do classes there and go down in these really neat, smelly libraries and go to Shakespearean plays and go to a lot of AA meetings over there. 
I didn't know. I thought they were really mad over there because they'd say, I got pissed last night. I was so pissed. And I was like, man, these people are mad. They're so angry. I didn't know that that I meant drink, so it took me a while. I had more fun going to meetings, though, and I've had more hospitality and, and loving hands reached out to me from complete strangers. The other students couldn't believe it. They're like, how'd you make a friend? We just came here. Because I'm being going, oh, I'm going out. Oh, I'm going to go have dinner on a boat with these people. They're cooking me dinner. And they'd be like, what are you doing? Ah, you know, <laughs> crazy. Yeah, and I went to school in Paris for a semester. I have beautiful daughters, too, that I've raised sober. Catherine's here with me. That's my greatest accomplishment, is raising a child sober. I love AA. That's all I know. <laughs> Too much to share in an hour. I'm going to share this. It's something that a guy wrote, and you've read it maybe on the Internet, the 23rd Psalm after recovery. It's written by an alcoholic named Roger Gleason. He was one of those guys that were in the first 2000 that sat at 48th Street Club in the same meeting in the same spot every week. And people would make fun of him for sitting there. And he never took credit for starting that club. He was a humble man. But he wrote this, and this he was proud of. And he did tell you. I had the signed copy. <sighs> the Lord is my sponsor. I shall not want. He maketh me to sit back and relax and listen with an open mind. He restores my soul and my sanity and my health. He leads me in the path of sobriety and serenity and fellowship for my own sake. He teaches me to think, to take it easy, and to live and let live, and to do first things first. He makes me honest, humble, and grateful. He teaches me to accept the things I cannot change, gives me courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Ye, though I walk through the valley of despair, frustration, guilt, and remorse, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy program, thy way of life, thy twelve steps, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies, fear, anxiety, self-pity, and resentment, and thou anointest my confused mind and jangled nerves with knowledge, understanding, and hope. No longer am I alone, neither am I afraid, nor sick, nor helpless, nor hopeless. My cup runneth over. Surely sobriety and serenity shall follow me every day of my life, 24 hours at a time, as I surrender my will to thine and carry the message to others. And I will dwell in the house of my higher power as I understand him daily forever. Amen. Thank you for letting me be of service. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.